Welcome everyone. My name is Margaret Chung. It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Wolness to the EMSL Exchange Seminar. Professor Wolness is a theoretical chemist and physicist. Since 2011, he has been a Welsh Foundation Professor of Science and Professor of Chemistry at Rice University. Professor Wolness is a co-director of the Center for Theoretical Biological Physics, CTBP, at Rice University. He is well recognized for his significant contribution to the theories of protein folding, glasses, and genetic network. He also established the Associative Memory Water Mediated Structure and Energy Model with a neat acronym, AWESOME, that is a coarse grain protein force field developed with Gary Pepoyan at the University of Maryland College Park. You will hear a lot about the AWESOME force field in his talk. AWESOME is established using a learning algorithm based on associative memory. The force fields in the simulations are optimized performing search through database. Professor Wolness is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the Ger German Academy of Sciences. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society, the Biophysical Society, the American Physiological Society, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and foreign member of the Royal Society. Highlighting the interdisciplinary nature of his research work covering all realms of science. Thank you, Professor Wolness. Um, please pre start your presentation. Okay. Well, thank you, Margaret. Uh, it's a it's a pleasure to be able to uh, present to people at uh, the EMSL. Uh, over the last uh, twenty years or so, I've been invited many times to uh, uh, serve on visiting committees there, but that always the time uh, worked out that it it just didn't uh, work. So I haven't had a chance to uh, to visit you there. Um, uh, in fact, despite many uh, invitations, also my my brother-in-law, uh, one of my brothers-in-law lives in Richland, but I've never been there. So maybe someday there'll be a good uh, reason to get I can, I can get there physically. Okay. Well, um, uh, what I want to give uh, you an idea of is a sort of direction that uh, we've been taking for I would say maybe even the last ten years. Uh, uh, or maybe even a smidgen more, uh, on trying to understand uh, uh, really biological problems at the systems level, but uh, using the fact that we now can understand and have a set of new ideas, uh, well, new relative to 20 or 30 years ago, about how biomolecules function. And we can also do computations about biomolecules that were beyond our reach, uh, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Um, and uh, and and uh, so uh, this is a sort of typical. Uh, no, I shouldn't say typical, but I would say this this kind of exercise is one at which you have to look at biology at several different uh, uh, scales. And uh, I understand that's actually a theme uh, of your laboratory as well. Um, uh, we uh, so far uh, limit ourselves primarily from the molecule uh, uh, to the cell. Uh, but um, uh, actually, our center has people who also work on the uh, uh, on, on tissue level uh, phenomena and things of that sort. And at least that's that's uh, a bit uh, 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 present here. Um, if I can go forward, ah, great. Um, you know, this is a sort of viewpoint of uh, how um, uh, a, a, a picture of some of the length scales that are involved in cell biology. Um, generally, you know, this is a kind of slide I would use a typical physics colloquium, and physicists are used to the idea that phenomena on one length scale uh, uh, only influence things on the higher length scale in a very, very uh, uh, straightforward way. Uh, maybe only a few parameters are needed uh, to go from one scale to the other. Uh, so, for example, particle physicists, once they've figured out what the mass of the proton is and what the mass of the electron is, that's all you really need to know to do chemical phenomena and so on. 
and they often have the the idea that um, that that these scales are insulated from each other, uh, except for these small number of parameters. Now, I think in biology we have a different situation to a certain extent. Um, if we look at the energy scales that are involved, the, there's uh, there. There's a set of energy scales that are related to the phenomena of chemistry in which we make and break covalent bonds. And these energy scales are quite large. Uh, that, that's why, for example, a DNA molecule is essentially permanent, uh, you know, if it's not uh, 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 in, a, in a complete biological context. A set of DNA from uh, 10,000 years ago can still be replicated and so on because most of its covalent bonds are still there. Um, on the other hand, uh, just knowing the uh, chemical level phenomena, the phenomena of how bonds uh, break are, are made and broken is not enough in biology because biological molecules form larger objects. So for example, uh, proteins, uh, although they're held together with some degree of permanence uh, through their chemical bonds, uh, they uh, also uh, assemble themselves, fold themselves into particular structures. How precise these structures are depends on the needs of the cell. Uh, some parts of, of um, protein molecules are very precisely configured so that they can uh, uh, provide recognition elements, so that they can provide the sort of delicate chemical environment so that other covalent chemistry can go on in enzymes. Uh, but other parts are more floppy or fuzzy, as some people like Monica Fuchsreiter like to say. And all of these things uh, 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 play a role in building up the still larger structures uh, in the cell. So, for example, the, uh, um, uh, the uh, individual protein molecules can assemble into large fibrous assemblies. Uh, of course, uh, uh, this is involved in all the motions of cells because motions of cells involve both motor molecules and actin fibers. Also, of course, we have a wide variety of diseases that involve the formation of fibrous assemblies. And I think we're starting to understand that uh, there's uh, other types of assemblies in uh, cells that are uh, perhaps not as precise as a fiber, uh, but that uh, do compartmentalize the cell. So we have phenomena like the so-called membraneless organelle. These fibers, though, are packed together in a very you know, tight, tight environment. They uh, uh, can even form uh, uh, larger uh, structures. Uh, we uh, usually can see those finally in light microscopes and so on. And of course, these larger structures tell cells where to go, where to move, how to communicate with each other. Uh, and then, uh, then at the largest length scales, uh, uh, from the micron on up, uh, cells start to behave as uh, you know, individual objects in tissues. Now, in general, uh, for the sort of intermediate levels, the energy scales go up with size. Uh, the interactions are made up of the same sort of van der Waals interactions that hold together a fluid or, uh, uh, or, uh, in or, or an organic polymer. Uh, but uh, because the uh, uh, because there's the molecules carry information, they can form structures that are fairly precise, as I said, at some stages, and that allows energy scales to grow up so that by the time you get to the size of a, an actin fiber, uh, 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 which is helping to move the cell around, that assembly is something which is a non-equilibrium object. It, it, it has energy scales that are so large it can't actually try out every possible configuration in its lifetime. So in general, we think that the energy scales go up as we go up in size. And then this is the trick of life, is that this is really a re-entrant phenomenon, that the chemical reaction energy scales, the ones where we do indeed break and make covalent bonds, uh, in fact, can be comparable to these energies that we build up for the large assemblies. So large assemblies can be moved around, can figure out what they're going to do through the use of chemical energy in the form of chemical reactions. And so in this way, we actually see the smallest length scale phenomena directly influence the larger length scale phenomena. 
And this is one reason why uh, each level of uh, bio, bi biology is not independent of the lower levels. Uh, we, we instead have a communication going from one to the other. And, uh, and it's, I think, one of the reasons why uh, I find that there's a tremendous number of surprises in cell biology. Uh, some people think the only complexity of cell biology is the large number of actors. Uh, and that is indeed one of the features of cell biology, uh, but that we basically know all of the physical chemistry that's involved in each of those uh, 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 activities of each of the actors. That's a viewpoint that's often taken by computational um, uh, biologists. But in fact, uh, or I shouldn't say in fact, in my experience, uh, every time we've looked at a problem at the level of the system, we've discovered that there's things going on in molecules that we had never really thought of before. Uh, and, uh, and, and I'm going to show you several examples of that today. Um, so in fact, what I'm going to do is discuss several case studies at the interface between physical chemistry and systems biology where this, this re-entrant aspect of the energies uh, plays a big role. Um, uh, these are actually um, mostly collaborative projects in one way or another. Uh, systems biology is so complicated, You, um, someone who comes as I do from physical chemistry has a hard time learning things without help. Um, uh, so, uh, so in each of these, there's uh, an important role of my collaborators who I'll mention as we go along. Uh, I'm going to first tell you a story about a long-standing collaboration I've had with Betsy Komovas at UCSD and others there, uh, which has to do with the, um, a particular uh, regulatory network in cells uh, that is, involves a molecule called NF-kappa-B and, uh, and another molecule called I-kappa-B. And it turns out that this sort of uh, network is involved in a huge number of activities that are medically important, um, as, as we'll see in a moment. One of the, uh, uh, and, and so that's one reason why we were able to support our study of this for quite a few years with the NIH. Um, I'll also talk about, and I'll probably run out of time on this, about a problem that's uh, sort of inspiring a lot of our activity uh, in my group and in the center and that involves work uh, somewhat collaborate, part of the work is collaborative with, uh, with Margaret Chung, uh, which is really on the problem of how do neural cells form memories. And uh, we'll uh, talk about a direct collaboration involving Margaret that you may have heard parts of already before, and I'll zoom over it then if, if I hear that you know everything, um, uh, that because uh, Margaret's already told you that. And then I'll talk about uh, another problem that involves the question about how memories can last as long as they do, um, which was actually my lead into this area of research. So um, I've I've emphasized that um, uh, that in systems biology we have large numbers of actors. We have many genes. You all, I'm sure, have seen all these charts of you know networks in the cell and huge numbers of uh, names of molecules and such like that. You can generate a huge such chart even for a prokaryote, uh, and I think even in prokaryotes, it's it's uh, it's a, a very complex business, uh, bacteria. Uh, but at least, uh, well, there are some aspects of bacterial systems biology that there's at least a, a shall I say, a, a received wisdom that seems at least 80% right. Uh, 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 we we understand a lot about how genes are regulated when they form a simple uh, circuit, uh, for example. Uh, but of course, are circuits independent of each other? Well, that's a deep question. Um, uh, or every time we've studied a problem like we, we studied the problem of sporulation in uh, Bacillus subtilis, we always found that whatever network we had, as we looked at more experiments, we got more complicated networks and so on. So it's certainly not obvious that, uh, that this is just a concatenation of small networks, but that's uh, at least uh, kind of a good place to start. It's, it's much worse in eukaryotes, and I've actually come to believe that there's very little that we actually understand about gene networks in, um, in eukaryotes. And the system that we're going to uh, talk about in the context of gene regulation is, is an example uh, of that. 
uh, several completely different things happen in um, in, in eukaryotes, uh, partly because they have larger genomes. There's much more of a problem of how do we uh, know what to do? How do you manage specificity in these systems? That's something that is quite fascinating, and I think we are don't know much about yet. Um, and um, uh, and another phenomenon is that the systems generally are not sort of simple steady states that last for a long time. It's uh, generally fine for bacteria to lie around for even tens of thousands of years doing nothing, waiting for food to become available. That's not really viable for a multicellular organism. And one of the things then that happens in multicellular organisms very commonly is that there's a large number of circuits that are not simply steady states of various types, but ones that lead to oscillation. And uh, and I'm going to explain something about uh, the NF Kevin B system in that context that I think is general. So NF Kappa B, as I said, is involved in many, many uh, uh, problems. Um, actually, that's why it is interacting, obviously, with a huge number of genes. Uh, that may be, as I said, something that makes it quite fundable, um, uh, although that's always relative. Uh, it's involved, as you see, in, in inflammation, in immunity, and in cancer. And actually, one of my students pointed out to me who is working on the NF Kappa B uh, problem. Uh, he, he found a picture of Tony Fauci when he was young, uh, and Tony Fauci was in front of a blackboard uh, showing basically the mechanisms of NF Kappa B as understood by Tony Fauci at age 40. Um, uh, and, uh, and so it's been a, 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 a problem for, for quite a long time. Uh, I also, uh, I'll have to tell uh, individual stories about this, but Tony Fauci once saved my life, so, uh, and not recently, but uh, 20 years ago. So he's, he's a good guy in my book. Uh, and he worked on NF Kappa B, uh, the system we're talking about here. So NF Kappa B can be turned on by a variety of, I should say, insults. One is when viruses come into cells, they create, they are recognized by immune cells. Immune cells start the production uh, uh, signal to the NF Kappa B system, turning it on. Once they turn it on, then those type of cells that are uh, uh, sensitive to antigens uh, create things called cytokines. The cytokines are actually the, the thing that gives rise to the famous COVID storm uh, and you know, also give you the fevers and all that that you get um, uh, when, you're, when you have an infection. But there are other ways that NF-kappa B can be turned on by free radicals, UV, et cetera. Um, and it's and, and something that can be turned on in many ways, but you also want it to be turned off. Uh, and that turns out to be part of the story where physical chemistry comes in. So the response to a stimulus uh, can be uh, studied uh, by uh, particularly uh, probing uh, individual cells with a, uh, a, 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 a signal, um, uh, something like, say, tumor and necrosis factor. Um, and, um, uh, and when you put in a pulse of uh, a signal that's going to activate the NF-kappa B network, it starts the cell uh, producing NF-kappa B, but it does so in a way that oscillates typically. Uh, here's a picture of some cells. I think this is done from David Baltimore's group uh, when Alex Hoffman, one of our collaborators, was a lead postdoc there. Um, and uh, what you can see is the cells are pulsing different colors, and that's because the NF-kappa B in this particular cell has been uh, fluorescently labeled, so that when there's a high concentration, the cell's one color, when it's low, it's another color. So you see that, uh, that, that the signal here, uh, say a simple signal being turned on, actually leads to something like uh, a, a pulse, then another pulse. It sort of looks like here on, on the average in a population, those pulses um, the, uh, the, the, those pulses sort of uh, die out uh, relatively slowly. They lose phase uh, in some sense. Um, so um, this is the, uh, the, the biological motivation. Uh, Betsy Kumovus uh, got me interested in NF-kappa B years ago because it turns out to uh, 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 
also involve the problem of how do biomolecules uh, recognize others and how do they find their partners in a very fast way? We had had an idea uh, maybe 30 years ago uh, of something called um, uh, fly casting, and you'll see an example of that in a moment. Uh, and Betsy said, oh, I think NF-kappa-B system is going to be the perfect example to study your fly casting mechanism. So that started us out in the, in, in the business. Um, uh, and uh, one of the things is you, you imagine in turning on genes, and of course the, gene, the, the uh, transcription factor, in this case NF-kappa-B, has to bind to DNA. It also has to come off of the DNA. Uh, and most people think that that's just an ordinary binding on and off equilibrium. If you look at the theory of bacterial gene switches by Potashny and so on, uh, that's uh, something described by the law of mass action. Uh, so it looks like there's not anything super interesting there. But here what's strange is NF-kappa B most of the time is not even in the form of the free molecule that can bind to DNA. Most of the time it's bound up with I-kappa B, which is an, an inhibitor of that um, molecule. And, uh, and so uh, one of the interesting questions is that how do we have these three molecules, the DNA, the NF-kappa B, and the I-kappa B interact? Can the DNA, for example, just uh, um, work its way in uh, to, uh, uh, to take an NF-kappa B, I-kappa B uh, construct and uh, uh, start a gene uh, regulatory process that way? The answer is no, but what about the reverse? And anyway, in our general studies of the problem of how NF-kappa B bound to I-kappa B and NF-kappa B separately bound to DNA, uh, Betsy decided to investigate what happens when they both um, are together at the same time. And uh, this was uh, uh, interesting. Her first observation of this was uh, 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 rejected by the journals, and they especially rejected one of her terms uh, uh, for various strange reasons. Uh, because they thought that the phenomenon that she found in which I kappa B, NF kappa B, and DNA are all together at the same time was some sort of in vitro artist artifact. So I'll show you that uh, our, our simulational work uh, um, uh, makes that seem very unlikely. And then also I'll show you some in cell work that shows that indeed this is a crucial part of how broadcasting networks work. So this is Betsy here. So one of the reasons we can start to do this thing and play these games in systems biology is that actually for about 10 years or more, we've been able to predict how proteins associate with each other reasonably well, especially if we already know their structures. Uh, and uh, we also have schemes for predicting the structures of proteins uh, when even parts of them are uh, uh, not uh, uh, fully known. It's always better to start with a structure that you know parts of it, uh, but uh, but 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 uh, we've been uh, we we under we've understood enough about protein folding to be able to make reasonable predictions of both binding and um, uh, end folding for for quite some time. Um, all of you who've been hearing about alpha fold um, realize that uh, that um, uh, this uh, so-called competition that one has. Uh, is something where one's really worried about, uh, do you get 90% of the things right, 50% of the things right, or 40% of the things right? And uh, uh, AlphaFold is um, uh, based on uh, at basically the same kind of physics that was used in these sort of studies. That's based on, uh, that, that's why we have the name associative memory uh, in, the, uh, in the title here, which I'll show you in a moment. But this shows you an idea of the quality of the predictions. Um, this was a, about a 10 years ago. Uh, we were looking at the formation of uh, complexes here where all the X-ray crystal structures were also known. And we would uh, compare our prediction of the crystal structure. There was one case where it looked like it, the, our interface was chosen in the wrong place. That's why there's this dip here. Actually, I sent back my uh, one of my students uh, uh, on this uh, to, I think it was uh, Nick Schaefer. Uh, at the time, I said, you know, look up, was there something funny about the crystallography? And uh, it turned out he said, oh, we've been using that as a standard test case, or people have used it as a standard test case, but the structure in the PDB is actually a predicted structure by somebody else. So probably our structure is a more correct structure than whatever was in the PDB at that time. 
Now, what is the associative memory water mediated structure and energy model? Well, there's two parts of it. One is that one has to um, uh, assign uh, uh, structures to small fragments, uh, and this is can be done in a variety of ways. Um, uh, and of course, that's done with not perfect uh, resolution. So you have a whole bunch of possible choices for the local structures. Uh, we can, on the other hand, write an energy function based on those, and that energy function will tend to, uh, uh, if if many of those uh, candidate structures are are similar that will have a tendency to form um, a consensus structure that way. Um, in the process of developing that kind of idea uh, over 30 years, we also understood that, that uh, we could use the same sort of neural network ideas to learn the interactions between residues that were not contiguous in sequence. Um, and uh, in doing that, we discovered there were interesting interactions that are mediated by water of course, this is well known in the case of the hydrophobic effect, but we also discovered that there were interesting, strange hydrophilic effects that showed up once we applied the sort of machine learning paradigms uh, we had to the database of complexes. Um, uh, that's about you know, 15 years ago. Um, to do the problem with the interaction with DNA, we also need to have a model for DNA that we can simulate on a reasonable time scale. The advantage of doing this sort of machine learning is instead of a protein molecule having thousands of atoms and having to worry about all the water around it, in awesome, uh, you have uh, only maybe hundreds of uh, interaction sites. And that makes the problem already uh, uh, much more programming much, much more efficient. So that you want to do the same thing with DNA. We didn't do that. Juan de Pablo, who's at uh, Argonne, uh, was at Argonne. I think he's been at the University of Chicago sort of back and forth. Uh, for many years, he came up with a similar kind of model for DNA and uh, called three spin. And then we uh, combine these together for the studies that I was I'm going to show you today. One of the key ideas that came out and once we understood about these interactions, these so called water mediated interactions is we could also go and take static structures and we could learn whether those structures are actually basically coherent and uh, contributing to the formation of order, that is to forming a folding foam, or whether they're somehow contradictory to the problem of having that particular order. So this, this concept of having some interactions that are uh, consonant with each other and consistent, and others that are not, is the concept of things being either minimally frustrated, where things are consistent, or highly frustrated if they're actually inconsistent with each other. So we actually have an algorithm that goes through and then allows us to quickly visualize in any given structure um, uh, what parts of the uh, uh, molecule are uh, contributing to the folding funnel and are consistently structured and what parts are working against it. Uh, this program is so quick, it runs on a, well, we have a website. If you look up uh, uh, frustration um, uh, uh, on, uh, and, and on, on the web, You'll, it'll lead you to two, a frustratometer on the web. You'll find two different websites. One tells you how frustrated you should be with your sports team. The other is our server, which tells you any molecular structure, where is it frustrated, where is it not frustrated? So in the case of NF-kappa B, uh, if we look at the structure of NF-kappa B bound to DNA, uh, you see that it's mostly minimally frustrated. It's got all these green bonds in it, but then this central hollow here uh, is, uh, is frustrated. When you put the DNA back in there, that frustration is gone. So that's why DNA wants, so to speak, to go into that place. When we, we also had a crystal structure of uh, a partial crystal structure of NF kappa B uh, with the I kappa B removed, sorry, with the I kappa B bound to it, uh, but with there, where there's a particular sequence part that was removed because it was disordered, uh, and it still is frustrated in the center. That disordered region doesn't show up in the in the uh, uh, crystallography, but we can put it back into the simulations and then see what happens to it. And what we see is it goes very nicely into this space where the DNA uh, used to be. So this sequence, so-called pest sequence, uh, also can remove the frustration of this pocket. So that pocket can become satisfied and have a reasonably stable structure either with NF kappa B 
sorry, either with DNA in it or with the pest sequence in it. So, uh, so the phenomenon that uh, uh, Betsy uh, found in the uh, ex experiment was that if you had NF kappa B bound to DNA and you add I kappa B, it actually actively removes the NF kappa B from the DNA. Uh, and as I said, the referees originally thought this was an artifact uh, for a weird experiment. Um, but uh, we decided to investigate it with the awesome simulation code. And uh, we have a variety of tools of how to analyze the free energy costs as large scale transformations go on. And this process is actually a, a, almost like a classical gas phase chemical reaction in physical chemistry. You have something like NF kappa B bound to DNA and you bring in the I kappa B. You form a ternary complex like Betsy observed in the laboratory. And then what can be left is the uh, DNA can leave rather than I kappa B. And now you've stripped the uh, the I uh, uh, you've stripped the NF kappa B from the DNA. This is the term actually Betsy invented called molecular stripping, and uh, they forced her to not use it in her first couple of papers uh, because uh, they said it was too uh, uh, impolite uh, as a word like, you know, I guess associating the idea of striptease or something. And if you know Betsy, you know that uh, that's pretty far from her style. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we, we've now uh, been able to get the word molecular stripping into the literature. Um, and I think it is pretty clear what uh, what's happening. Another molecule comes in and causes a, a molecule to be dissociated. So it's a facilitated form of dissociation. So anyway, these calculations were done with Awesome by uh, mostly, uh, oh, man, uh, uh, David Patoyan, who's now an assistant professor at um, uh, Iowa uh, State, uh, and uh, Weiwa uh, Zheng uh, in my group. Now here's actually a movie, um, and uh, uh, let's see, uh, the way we make the movie is, uh, of course, we've sampled all of those configurations along the way. We can cluster them. Then after we've clustered them, this is like what a crystallographer often does. A crystallographer has two or three structures, and then they show how one could be moved into the other. In our case, we have hundreds of structures, so we're able to morph them and get a much more continuous uh, movie. So you can see that the I kappa B is moving in, the blue I kappa B is moving in from the side. The DNA is just kind of uh, moving around in the cavity. Uh, and now the I kappa B binds. It actually causes the NF kappa B to open up slightly. The NF kappa B looks like two hands grabbing the DNA, but this makes one of the hands pull to the side. So the DNA is only being bound by one hand instead of two hands. And now you see also that this pest sequence makes its way into the into the uh, into the uh, uh, cavity. So that looks pretty organized, uh, and that's I think one reason why we thought that this is real and not an artifact. So why am I? Uh, so we of course puzzled. Why would that be? How you know it sort of makes the mechanism complicated. But 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 is there a reason why that would be useful to have molecular stripping? And uh, as I said, one of the problems that uh, confronted us was that um, uh, the uh, uh, NF kappa B works on lots of different uh, cellular uh, networks downstream. It broadcasts to many different things that have to be turned on, and also all of them have to be turned off. So NF kappa B, one of the things it does is it binds to a gene that creates the I kappa B. Uh, so that's part of the network of I kappa B, uh, but uh, uh, of, of NF kappa B, but also it binds to some other, uh, uh, say, several hundred genes that are supposed to be activated. It also binds apparently to 20,000 other sites. So what do we do about that? Well, uh, um, we started to study that with stochastic uh, simulation techniques. Uh, David Potoyan uh, set up things using what's called the Gillespie algorithm for this. Uh, and what's interesting is you can study the problem without the I kappa B stripping process. And it looks like the gene switch works reasonably well when you turn the simulation off. Simulation off, 
the I kappa B uh, starts to build up and finally turns the gene off. Uh, but you also see that there's a lot of kind of noise at the end. That's why we do it stochastically. There's noise. And what that noise is, is you're just waiting for the, D in, in this kind of uh, approach, you're just waiting for the, the, D the uh, uh, DNA to dissociate from the NF cup. We had various different sites. And, uh, and there's 10,000 sites, so some of them are stragglers. So these stragglers mean that some gene, uh, some gene networks would be left on, but in an unpredictable way. So uh, this crisis is solved actually by the stripping. So this is the, uh, most of this, uh, is this is the standard uh, model. Standard model is that an external stimulus causes I kappa B to fall off of NF kappa B. That makes NF kappa B an active form. It goes into the nucleus. One of the genes it turns on is I kappa B, which in the standard model just goes out there and we wait around for the uh, uh, NF kappa B to fall off. But in, with molecular stripping, it comes in instead and, uh, and, 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 and actively removes uh, NF kappa B from the genes. So, um, What happens now is when we turn the stimulation off, so we have two different sets of curves here. One is what happens when you have it on and you turn the stimulation off. The other is what happens with steady stimulation. Um, and um, uh, uh, the, the, le the left column and the right column. Uh, the top curves are what happen if you have no stripping. Yeah, the NF kappa B comes off eventually of the DNA, but you can see there's lots of stragglers. When you do the thing below, uh, when you have uh, I kappa B stripping, what you discover is it turns everything off all at once. So you don't have any stranglers, you don't have any extra um, uh, uh, processes uh, going on. Um, and uh, in steady stimulation, you, you get pulses, very clean pulses rather than sort of straggly pulses. So, uh, as you saw in our molecular story, there was a clear uh, 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 role for this sequence that we called the pest sequence. So, it was very natural to mutate it uh, and uh, mutate it to something that uh, leaves the frustration in that inner shell. Um, and, uh, and so, it really doesn't want to go in to replace the DNA. Still, the DNA can eventually leave, and we have similar kind of um, uh, 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 diagrams, uh, but quantitatively different diagrams when we have the wild type with the pest sequence and the one uh, with a mutant uh, pest. But you can see that the barrier to uh, being pulled off is considerably larger. Uh, and then we were able to get Alex Hoffman to uh, uh, make these mutants and look what happens in individual cells. And um, he was able to see that when you had the wild type, you got fairly nice pulses. But in the uh, mutant wild type, even though the binding constants of I kappa B to DNA and of, D of, of uh, uh, I kappa B to, N sorry, NF kappa B to DNA and I kappa B to, uh, to NF kappa B were still exactly the same. In this case, uh, the kinetics are different, and we still find now that we have completely straggly kind of pulses. So I think this is really a sign that it's essential in a broadcasting network to have this sort of detailed molecular mechanism of molecular stripping. Um, as I said, I, I realize I'm probably talking too slowly here, uh, but uh, and so I, I want to kind of uh, uh, zap ahead a little bit, um, uh, and, and I'll uh, jump over some slides. Um, one of the issues here at the CDBP that Margaret has been involved with us in for well, about five or six years is actually the mechanism of memory. Uh, and uh, she was coming at this through um, the interaction with uh, Neil Waxham, uh, about the, um, who's a, a neurobiologist, about the initiations of memories. We came at from, from um, uh, 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 sort of sideways uh, through uh, uh, work by Eric Kandel, who implicated a kind of protein aggregation process in uh, the formation of memories. So I'm going to just uh, zap ahead just to say that, first of all, there's a 
uh, a phenomenon. You have to initiate the formation of a memory. This is done by, again, in this case, an electrical signal, not by tumor necrosis factor. What happens is it goes in and uh, 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 causes a calcium signal. The calcium signal causes a big rearrangement of an actin cytoskeleton. Uh, and, uh, and it involves several different proteins, uh, one of which is called calmodulin, uh, and the other one is a protein called CAM kinase 2. Um, and, uh, and in fact, they form uh, detailed structures. So uh, I, this topic, again, I imagine you may have heard a bit about, so I'm going to go very quickly just to say that it's possible to um, uh, use these same tools of uh, awesome uh, on the interactions of biomolecules with actin uh, cytoskeleton, uh, sorry, with actin uh, threads rather than DNA threads. Uh, again, one's helped by the fact that part of these molecules is are, are quite well visualized by X-ray crystallography. Uh, however, how they bind, how the molecule CAM kinase 2 binds to actin is not completely obvious. Um, uh, uh, but then with the use of the um, uh, awesome, we're able to uh, predict a structure, and the structure actually agrees quite well with uh, Neil Waxham's cryo-EM. Now, one of the other aspects of this problem is that this part of the molecule that was structured uh, was, again, quite, uh, uh, you know, its, its structure was quite well known. It is definitely involved in setting up uh, detailed structures. So, for example, once we know the angles at which such a washer uh, binds to an actin thread, we can make predictions about where the uh, where the CAM kinases are, we can make predictions about what angles and what kind of structures we form, and indeed they agree with electron microscopy. But part of the molecule involves a thing called a regulation domain and a linker domain, and these are unstructured normally in the uh, molecule by itself. They're intrinsically disordered parts of the protein, one might say. And uh, the question is, are they still intrinsically disordered when they come in contact with uh, actin? So we uh, can use awesome to see what structures they would have when they bind to uh, actin. And uh, what we uh, discover is that uh, we can predict then a full structure of the regulation domain and the linker binding up with the uh, actin fiber. And it's rather uh, sophisticated in the sense that it's not binding to a single actin monomer, but to uh, several in a row. And uh, I think this movie, is this a movie? No, this is a still of the, of the most important structure. Um, and one of the things that's interesting is that calmodulin, the, the carrier of calcium when it comes in, also combined with these regulation domains. And basically it, does something like the molecular stripping mechanism, the same one that we talked about for NF-kappa B, that the calmodulin can bind to the regulatory domain or the regulatory domain can be bound to the actin fiber. It can't bind simultaneously with both. And this is how the calmodulin, once it's gotten some calcium in it, is partly able to uh, strip uh, the CAM kinase off of the actin and allow the network to reconfigure. So the other problem that brought me into the problem of memory was a kind of, uh, uh, you know, even, even older uh, question. Uh, it was a problem about, well, how can memories actually be preserved for long periods of time? The mechanism we just talked about there tells you how you could get a network to expand and change its structure. It could do that in response to electrical calcium signals. But then why doesn't the structure just fall back to where it was before? Why doesn't it just, you know, uh, you know, uh, why don't you just immediately forget? Or maybe not immediately, but you definitely would need to forget by the time the proteins that are involved in forming these structures are degraded. Now, we know neural cells typically have slower degradation than other cells, but still, uh, it's hard to see how you could have uh, structures that are stable for 50 years. And like almost all interesting problems in molecular biology, Francis Crick had something interesting to say about this already in 1984. 
And he suggested that what you have is you just have to have some very big uh, uh, aggregates of proteins because they're very big, they'll be quite stable. Uh, and also they would have a hard time moving around so they could be localized to a particular synapse, so, uh, sorry, to a particular dendritic spine. And uh, uh, Eric Kandel, uh, who's a you know Nobel laureate in um, uh, neurobiology, and uh, Susan Lindquist, who was a great prion uh, specialist before she passed away at a young age, um, unfortunately, uh, they identified a particular protein that um, uh, does this, that seems to form prions when the cell is stimulated to remember things. And uh, so uh, I gave one of my students, Ming Chen Chen, a starter project, which was predict the structures of these um, uh, 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 CPEB assemblies. And it was quite easy, but odd. What it turned out is these structures, the protein that was uh, forming the prion didn't form, obviously, uh, immediately a prion. They formed these helical bundles, and uh, they're very nice. And in fact, uh, Kandel and Lindquist said, well, most of the time, the cell, before it's formed a memory, this protein is present in some kind of helical bundle form. And so in that sense, we got the right answer. Then the question is, how does it turn into, <coughs> excuse me, how does it turn into a beta sheet aggregate? And Ming Chen uh, uh, came up with an idea that's really elegant, I would say, in, sim in its simplicity. This protein was known by uh, by Kendall and Lindquist to bind to the cytoskeleton. Well, if it's bound to the cytoskeleton and the cytoskeleton, say, changes structure, maybe through that calcium signaling, depending on exactly where it's bound and how it's bound, uh, you could be pulling on these assemblies. And of course, when you pull on something that's coiled up, it straightens out. So um, uh, we were able to sort of show that actually a fairly modest amount of force that quite within the range that you can get in the cytoskeleton was enough to convert the alpha helical coils into a beta sheet aggregates and then form a prion in this way. Uh, so, uh, so there's an interesting aspect here because it turns out that it's the prionic form, this sort of aggregate form of the prion, which uh, of, of CPEB, which uh, uh, also uh, turns out to interact with RNA. And it interacts with RNA in such a way that it turns on the translation of RNAs, turns on the translation of, R of only some specific RNAs, but one of them is actually actin itself. So you can see that there's a feedback cycle. Once you form this prion, it'll be pretty stable. It will also sort of tell actin mRNAs to be active. Once they're active, they start to translate things, and you get more actin monomers coming in, so you can keep this thing really as a very stable uh, object. So again, a very high level, systems level thing that's being powered by a molecular aggregation level phenomenon. And uh, uh, very recently, of course, that leads to the puzzle. Why is it that the RNA binding form is, uh, why is it, uh, sorry, why is it in the aggregated form that it changes the translation of RNA? And uh, uh, my uh, 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 student, uh, Shinyu Gu, uh, came up with a really elegant idea for this. Uh, it was that uh, once you've formed an aggregate, the process of, of translation uh, is influenced by the fact that after a single translation event has occurred, uh, the protein is, uh, sorry, the, the, the ribosomes are still around, and so they're able to make another translation event and so on. And so, uh, so there's a, a possibility to, uh, that the assembly will act as a, a factory for making, um, for, for, for uh, making uh, uh, ribosomes translate the RNA. Uh, so this is a phenomenon we call vectorial channeling. Um, and uh, we have only two experimental examples of it. One is the CPEB fiber, uh, the CPEB fiber where the, where the aggregated form uh, uh, accelerates the formation of, uh, of, uh, of the translation of the RNA. We also have another protein called RIM4, which forms aggregates. And there the aggregate 
makes it harder to uh, uh, translate the RNA that it's supposed to. And uh, there was a sort of puzzle about this directionality. And basically the mechanism though, is that it depends on the fact that translation of RNA is a vectorial process. It starts from uh, one end of the RNA and goes to the other in a general way. It starts from the five prime end and goes to the three prime end. So it depends on whether the five prime end is in the in the bound part or in the uh, in the outside part. Um, so uh, uh, Shin Yu was able to solve the problem of how the rates change. I'm zooming over this because I've run out of time. I see, uh, but basically this model at least can account for the uh, way in which uh, forming aggregates uh, can change uh, rates and therefore uh, act as a regulatory element. It's really a kind of cool example because I think it even gives you an idea about how did organelles ever get started in the first place? Uh, why bring stuff together all in one place and so on? This seems to be a very nice example of that in a fairly simple way. Um, and um, uh, I think it may be a, a theme that we'll see in many other uh, systems biology problems. So I'm sorry that I had to rush through the last uh, problems, but let me just uh, acknowledge then my uh, uh, various co-workers uh, whose work I've talked about. Uh, this general area of physicochemical neurobiology, there's many more things we've been doing in it. Uh, Shin Yu Gu, uh, 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 I mentioned, uh, is working on this now, Ming Chen Chen, Nick Schaefer, uh, uh, and Margaret uh, has been a big leader of our group effort on that, and Herb Levine's been involved in part of that work. Uh, he was uh, one of the directors of the center, but he uh, moved recently to Boston. Uh, work on protein DNA interactions started with Bin Zhang and David Patoyan, um, and they were, um, uh, Bin Zhang's associate professor now at MIT, um, and uh, doing great work on even much more sophisticated problems. And then, as I mentioned, there's quite a bit of work on the nf kappa b system uh, that we did with Betsy. And the idea of frustration analysis, which just entered in quickly in this study, is something that um, uh, uh, Betsy and I and Diego came up with about 15 years ago. And Diego is even the one who really has been flying with this and uh, 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 develops the website that you guys can all, all use. Uh, funding, of course, from the NIH and, of course, for the center uh, through the NSF, as well as a, a raise grant. OK, well, thank you. Um, and I'll be happy to take questions if we have some more time. Thank you. Um, I got a question from the chat. Let me start with that. The question is from Bill Cannon. Um, molecular stripping movie. Uh, about that slide. Is there a potential applied to drive the association or is this a non-equilibrium simulation? I'm a little, let me go back to the movie. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, let me go back to the movie. Um, and then also say a little bit about how the movie is done. Um, of course, yes, if you were to just take nf kappa b DNA complex and um, and an i kappa b and you threw them into awesome and ran this thing, uh, you'd be spending a tremendous amount of time uh, just with uh, 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 i kappa b uh, 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 you know, floating around outside. It's really doing a diffusion motion. So this is not a really a movie of exactly what would be happening. What would be happening is the 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 I kappa B would be jiggling away and jiggling around and then occasionally somehow getting close and doing this. The way this movie was done then was to go back to the free energy profile, which we also use, we can use those same kind of calculations, bias them with the reaction coordinate of trying to bring NF kappa B close to the DNA, and another way of biasing it to make the NF kappa B come close to the I kappa B. We, of course, bias the simulation to do that, but then we remove the bias to get this free energy profile. That's a sort of method called weighted histogram sampling. Um, and so then after you've formed this, this ensemble, uh, we, well, we see you have an ensemble where things have been categorized by how far away are they. 
and uh, and it's those structures that we then link up together, like in the um, like in the uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, in the uh, uh, like the way crystallographers would do to make that movie. So the 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 movie is uh, biased to see one complete event. You can see that that uh, the, that the uh, depending on concentrations, this process could take minutes. So it's not literally a movie of exactly what happens. It's really a movie of what are the changes that occur as the thing approaches and as the other molecule leaves. Um, the system is not. Um, uh, in general, the system is not at equilibrium because the um, uh, uh, when, when you don't have much I kappa B present, the NF kappa B will never fall off of the DNA and uh, and vice versa. If the I kappa B is on the NF kappa B, the DNA will never be able to get in there to to uh, to, to strip it off of the I kappa B. That's how the, the, the sequence works. So although this is a plot, uh, where I think we've tuned things so that it's equi, uh, equal free energies at the beginning and the end. Uh, in reality, the concentrations will be such that uh, either the beginning path is the main one or the end path is the main one. I, I hope that answers what you were getting at. So that shouldn't be taken as a, uh, as a, as a literal movie. You know, the problem is that literal movies of how molecules work would be incredibly boring. Uh, because things would just be diffusing around all the time, and then every now and again, something happens, and uh, you'd have to be able to tell people uh, wait around <laughs> uh, and, and, and see that. Um, but at least here we have a controlled way of uh, organizing the structures. Thank you. Um, I see a hands up. That's Song Ben Song. Hey. Um, hi. Uh, very nice talk uh, about the molecular scraping. So when you're comparing with and without the scraping mechanism, uh, I'm talking about the reaction uh, kinetics stuff. Right. So I suppose that if you could sample the, the energy of different uh, complexes and the, the, the molecules, you could actually infer that, you know, you, you could automatically to deduct the, the mechanism, right? What I mean is the really the, the oscillation stuff. Well, um, that's a real. Um, that's not actually a single molecule um, uh, uh, simulation. It's a single. Well, there are many. Uh, there are many genes uh, that that are are, are being studied, um, and uh, I think I'm showing uh, even some somewhat average results from different runs. Um, you know, I, I don't think that the amount of, say, energy involved in the oscillation is very, very large. And uh, that's why, in a way, you know, there is something a little funny uh, when we talk about things being non-equilibrium. Um, uh, the amount of energy that's involved in the degree of non-equilibriumness is really quite small. Uh, most things that are going on in the cell really are kind of close to equilibrium. It's just that a few collective coordinates are kept away from equilibrium. And those are the, of course, the ones that are very interesting to us. They're what, you know, means the, the, the thing is alive and not just sitting there. Uh, but, uh, um, uh, and, and in some ways, I think people uh, uh, it may be bad of us to sort of say that, 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 that uh, uh, it's, it's completely non-equilibrium in the sense that you know, most of the degrees of freedom are not all that far from equilibrium. We're not, we're not really moving things like super, super fast or, or anything like that. It's, it's, it's not like uh, uh, the chemistry of explosives or something like that, where every molecule is not at all given by a Boltzmann distribution. Almost everything's kind of at equilibrium, except for a few collective degrees of freedom. And, uh, 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 which may not be, I think people always think of the other situation as being quite uh, quite sexy is the word that comes to my mind. Maybe that's not that, but you know, very exciting. But in some ways it's more interesting that it's just a few degrees of freedom that are not at equilibrium, but they're the ones that make the difference between being alive and being dead. So it's pretty interesting. 
Yeah, I guess I guess the driving force is actually the the compartmentalized the, that uh, right. The it's the concentration changes. The concentration yeah, the phosphorylation changes. actually drives the in, in, inside and then outside, and, and that drives the yeah. The that's thing, that's right? also a key component of this, which we're not uh, right. which we didn't but, talk about in this talk, but it's actually something we've looked at the the role of phosphorylation and changing structures and stuff like that. There's the the NF kappa B field. Um, uh is is vast uh and uh uh we've done things on i would say pointillistic aspects of it um and i'm only giving one little part here that's sort of a simple story there's so many more uh tricky things like there's i said there's i kappa b but there's actually an i kappa b alpha beta gamma delta epsilon gamma and yeah. zeta they use at least half of the Greek alphabet, and the real aficionados like like Alex Hoffman uh, are extremely excited about uh, each one of those, and they do somewhat different things, and it's all very interesting. and And, and we've contributed a little bit to that, but but it's actually hard for me to keep track of the the complexity uh, of that. But yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank very you. Interesting. Thank you, Saul.